So welcome to our uh, grand finale, the Influencers Panel. Uh, I'm just here to introduce Yves Saint-Ange, who will run the show and uh, introduce our panelists. So Yves is the VP Public Affairs and Marketing at the Canada S&T Museums Corporation. He's a communication expert who has, has uh, done work in, in several very different uh, organizations and well placed to uh, deal with the finale for us. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Mark. And uh, it's a great honor for me to actually be uh, uh, chairing and, and introducing our expert uh, panelists this afternoon as the, the last uh, panel. Um, these are remarkable individuals, definitely, that uh, will have great insights on our discussion on influencers and uh, how to access influencers uh, from our science and technology communications agenda. Uh, so the, the the procedure for this panel is that I'll after my I'll introduce each of our four panelists in uh, my alphabetical order. I'll ask them to actually comment on the the topic that they were provided on science and technology communications and science and society, um, and and then after that I believe Mark and Gordon you'll be presenting some of the. Uh, findings from the corporation and then the panel will have a chance to react to those findings. So um, I'll proceed right away uh, with the presentations. Uh, first I'd like to introduce Madame Denise Amio. Uh, Denise is the uh, president and CEO of the, Canadian, of the Association of Canadian Community Colleges, uh, the national international and international voice for uh, 130 of Canada's publicly funded colleges. Um, uh, serving 1.5 million learners of all ages across the country and uh, in, uh, in campuses in 1,000 communities. Um, I know Denise a lot because she was most recently my boss at the <laughs> Canada Science and Technology Museums Corporation, uh, a corporation that is engaged in fostering scientific and, 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 and technological literacy. Uh, through three museums, the uh, Science and Technology Museums, the Agriculture and Food Museum, and the Aviation and Space Museums, or as Denise used to say, everything from Holstein to Einstein, or vice versa. <laughs> uh, Denise had a long career in the federal public service, had held very senior positions in the world of, uh, of HR management, communication management, program management, and, and on and on and on. And she was also very uh, active. She's, she's a passionate individual, and she actually propelled excellence in public service as a, the past president for public of, of the Institute of Public Administration in Canada. She was the past vice president of the head of federal agency steering committee and was on the board of the governors of Algonquin Colleges and this institution, uh, University of Ottawa, and also is a member of the editorial board of the Canadian Government Executive Magazine. Um, and uh, as she, not only she also uh, chairs the uh, the current ISSP advisory committee, and uh, she, uh, uh, Madame Amio, has a master's degree in education and three bachelors in biology, arts, and education. So she is clearly uh, well educated to this discussion. Uh, the next presenter will be Scott Finlay. Scott is a, an associate professor at the Department of Biology, where he has been since 1988. He received his uh, um, bachelor degree from uh, Queen's University in 81, a PhD from the Department of Zoology in the University of Toronto in 88. From 92 to 96, uh, he was the director of physical science of the St. Lawrence Ecosystem Recovery Project, a 2. Point to five million eco research program funded by the federal green plan, if I remember those days in 1992, and uh, a, which provided science-based public policy recommendation for ecological remediation in the, in the Cornwall Messina area of concern. Um, Mr. Finley is a core member of the University of Ottawa Institute ISSP and a former director of University of, of Ottawa's Institute for the Environment. Uh, Pat Mooney, uh, Mr. Mooney, is, uh, as for more decade, uh, had experience in, the, in working on international uh, civil society, first addressing aid and development issues, and then focusing on food, agriculture, and community trade. In 1977, Mr. Mooney co-founded RAFI, Rural Advancement Fund International, 
uh, which was renamed the Etc. Group or ETC Group in 2001. He received the Right Livelihood Award, the Alternative Nobel Prize in the Swedish Parliament in 1985, and the Pearson Pri Peace Prize from the Canada Governor General in 1998. He also received the American Giraffe Award given to people who stick their neck out. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> um, he is the co-author of, uh, or the author or co-author of several books on the politics of biotechnology and biodiversity. Mr. Mooney is wider, widely regarded as an authority on issues on glo of global governance, corporate concentration, and intellectual property monopoly. Um, although ETC, et cetera's work group, uh, work continues to emphasize uh, on plant genetic resources and agricultural biodiversity, their work expanded to include biotechnology, nanotechnology, synthetic biology, geoengineering, and new development in genomics and neurosciences. And the last speaker is Madame Van Lack, Madame Louise Van Lack. Uh, uh, he is a doc she's a doctor in, in sociology and director of the Institute of Science and in the and of the Environment, and she's a tenure professor at the Department of Sociology at UCAM in Montreal. Mrs. Van Lack has been involved with the Canadian Commission for UNESCO since 2002. During those years, she was a member of the Commission's membership committee and of its sectoral commission, Natural, Social, and Human Sciences, which she chairs since May 2012. Uh, Madame Van Lack is also a researcher and former director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on Biology, Health, and Society and the Environment, a collaborating center for the Pan-American Health Organization and the World Health Organization. She is an associate professor in the Department of Social and Preventative, Preventive Medicine in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Montréal, a researcher with the international team in nano safety, and a member of Quebec Centre Interinstitutional, uh, Quebec Centre Interinstitutionnel de Recherche en Ecotoxicologie, a member of the Paul Risk MRSH at the University de Caen in France, and a member of the Scientific Council of the Committee for Research and Independent Information on Genetics, Engineering, in France. Um, and uh, she's also involved in a range of initiative uh, on, on the health environment, economy, and ethics. And she also sits on the board of the Montreal International Documentary Festival. So she's interested in cinema. And, and, and basically, that has a lot to say about science and communication, obviously, and uh, initiated the science and environment section of the festival Eco Camera. And she has received uh, numerous awards and bursary and uh, hold an honorary doctorate from the, in techno science, ethics, environment, and society from the Royal Military College in Kingston. So I think you'll agree with me, we have quite fascinating panel here and people that have lots of credentials. So uh, I'm going to stop here right away and uh, let our first speaker, I'll ask Madame Amio to start. Oh, Denise? yeah, it's always like that, alphabetical order, <laughs> all my life. <laughs> that's, the, the, that's the problem when your name starts with an A. Um, bonjour. So it's a pleasure to, to be here with you. So I'll do my presentation in English, but if you have any questions in French, uh, don't hesitate. Um, science and society. Um, the first thing I want to say is that they go together. You, you cannot have a society without science, and you cannot have science without society. Um, and I won't talk about the past, about how it started, but I believe that since they were human beings, that's what they did. Now, the questions I had for this panel was, how do we improve science policies? And how can we influence change in science policies? So I'll try to address it from my experience of what I've seen both being inside, meaning in government, and also being now outside government. 
And so I'll give you my perspective. It doesn't mean that it is the perspective, but that's what I've learned so far. The first thing is really about positioning. Everything is about positioning. And it's about positioning the issue. And then ensure that you have a story when you position your issue. Because it's not enough just to talk about the issue and the facts. You need to ensure that it, um, and I'll use a word in English, I, I hope it will convey what I mean, it has to reverberate with the people. So people need to understand what you are talking about. And so there are three parts to that. The first one, when it's time to position your, your story, if you want, the first thing that is important is the relevancy of what you're talking about. It has to be real. People need to be able to understand what it is that you're after, what it is that you want to change. The second thing is the public. How will you present that to ensure that everybody understand? Because when it's time to present policies or to change policies or introduce new policies, if you're not able to make sure that people understand what it is that you're after, you're losing your time all the time. And unfortunately, sometimes we're so close to the science that we forget about who we do that for, which is the public. At the end of the day, it's the public. They are people, they are um, policymakers that will need to defend the policy. But if the public, at the end of the day, to, that will be concerned by this policy, if they don't understand, you're losing your time. And let me give you an example. The example I will give you is already, <laughs> my God. The example I will give is, uh, in fact, global warming. Many years ago, that's the way we used to call the change, uh, the cl climate change, where we're talking about global warming. Guess what was the problem? People, especially Northerners, they were thinking, wow, this is good news. What's the problem? <coughs> uh, the climate will get warmer. Eh? Uh, it will be more comfortable, less snow, less cold. And it took years for scienti scientists to realize the mistake they had made. Because now it was in the, dans le conscient, in the, in the psyche, if you want, of people. And they felt no problem with uh, global warming. So I give that as a prime example of the public. So uh, many of you will one day develop policies or will provide facts for the development of policies. So always think about that. So that's why you never hear now, almost, about global warming. You hear about climate change. Because people realize, if you talk about climate change, then people will realize that, okay, you talk about extremes. You talk about very, very cold or very warm and tornadoes and all kinds of uh, uh, major events that will happen that were not there before. And... Uh, I will finish because I only have one minute left, I believe, and uh, I'm only at page one of two pages. Um, so there was relevancy, the public, and the third part is the results. To measure the impact of your policy and to ensure that you monitor it and that you share the outcomes of that. Because often there are policies that are put in place and they stay there forever, but they are not pertinent anymore, and the people need to move on. We need, we, we, we need to um, reach out to new things, and I will have stories, hopefully, in the questions that I could, I could share with you. I guess my time is up. Yeah. Thank you so much, Denise. <laughs> Before I have the hook. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, talking stick to Mr. Finlay. Oh, okay. I'm Sorry. next. Great, thank you. Well, let me um, start by saying that I, I feel a bit intimidated here because I, I think with respect to the expertise and knowledge of my co-panelists, uh, mine is 
is much more limited. I've tried to think about a little bit about the questions that we were asked and also to formulate some probably incohate thoughts about those questions, particularly as it pertains to some of the comments that I heard in the previous session, the wrap-up session. So let me just, and I should also say that these comments or suggestions are possibly completely idiosyncratic, um, so they may not be of much value. But in any event, here it goes. Uh, the first one, and, and I've organized them in kind of a couple of themes. So I have the themes, the implications, and I guess what we would call notionally action items. So theme number one, which as a scientist, I am, for my sins, a practicing scientist. And, and uh, I believe that science, the, the wellspring of science, is creativity and imagination as it is in, in most human enterprises. So that's something that everybody, I believe, in society can relate to, it, irrespective of their particular interest or irrespective of their vocation or their avocation. Creativity and imagination, to my mind, is, is a universal. So if we want to embed uh, the real wellspring of science in society, I believe that what we need to do first and foremost is uh, is to foster the baseline for, for creativity and imagination, which is curiosity. So the implication of that is that if we're thinking about ways and means to move forward, what we need to do is focus on sustaining and empowering institutions that first and foremost foster creativity and imagination, and this is scientific or otherwise. And uh, I would argue that for such institutions that fostering creativity and imagination is the prime directive. Now, having said that, let me also say that there are institutions around, uh, I am part of one, academe, uh, which I am not, after having been spent 26 years here, convinced that fostering creativity and imagination is indeed its prime directive. The second implication is that... Um, Creativity and imagination depend, I believe, on the open communication of ideas and results, and this speaks to a theme that we have been addressing through this session. And that means two things, in my mind, open access and open communication of scientific information. So this gets back to the point, I think, that Jeff Kinder made a little earlier about open science. The action items that I have that would be associated with that are, first of all, develop and implement an open access policy for scientific results and data, as Jeff, I think, and others have talked about. And secondly, develop and implement a federal communication policy that lays out in pretty specific terms the rights and responsibilities of government scientists in communi communicating their science to the public. And if I can throw in uh, my own two cents worth about what the basis for that policy would be, it would be that the predisposition is that government science, the scientific results should be freely and openly accessible and communicated unless there's compelling reasons for doing otherwise. The second theme, as we've already alluded to in, in a number of different contexts, is that communication is critical, communication with the public. Uh, but it appears that simply subjecting the public to a barrage of scientific facts isn't very effective. So uh, what do we need to do about that? Well, here's an idea. How about we develop uh, in collaboration with a bunch of different institutions, so that would be academic institutions, government institutions, NGO institutions, an educational program that is designed to improve science literacy, but not about the products of science, but the process of science. And uh, that is, when we talk about science literacy, it's not knowing biology or physics, it's knowing about the process of science first and foremost. And I believe, and the way to do, one, one possible way to do this is to focus on the importance of scientific evidence, be it social science evidence, physical science evidence, natural science, biomedical science. Because I think the notion of evidence is something that many people can relate to who may not particularly relate to science. The second thing that I would say is that we need to focus on science as a way of sustaining values. 
And there's a tendency among scientists to think that it's science that informs values, but I think I've become, I've come to learn that it's actually the other way around. And I believe that a communication strategy which focuses first and foremost on how science can sustain and foster the plurality of values that Canadians hold, I think will be much more effective than an educational strategy that's supposed to teach people about physics or biology or whatever it happens to be. Um, the third thing, and this is, a, this is a comment for scientists, is I think we need desperately to acknowledge the limitations of our craft. Science is a human enterprise, and as such, it's subject to all of the infelicities and peccadillos and serendipities and ills that plague any human enterprise. And I think to deny that that's the, fate, the case, either implicitly or explicitly, I think is hugely problematic. I think we need to acknowledge uncertainty, but in a particular way. You know, it, it, as a scientist, I get really exercised about this. They talk about uncertain science, and I say, there is no other type. All science is uncertain. If it's not uncertain, it ain't science. That's the nature, that's the guts of science. And we have to make sure that we impress that message on the public. And finally, and I'd like to follow up here on Denise's uh, excellent comment, we have to understand who the client is. We in academe, in government, we are civil servants. Our role is to do science in the public interest. And I think sometimes we lose track of that. And that, losing track of that, detracts from our ability to convince the public of the importance of science. Thank you. Mr. Moody. Thank you. Uh, I can follow up on what Scott was saying, I think. Last week was a bad week for science in the, both the lead editorials in The Economist magazine and in New Scientist, where, uh, and the report and the major articles that following that were talking about the failures of science research around neurosciences and uh, referring back to some of the same failures about a dozen years ago related to genomics as well. And so it's a good time to talk about how science is perceived. Most of my time is spent in United Nations meetings where, where science is most, scientists in science are most often used against their will, I think, as, as a blunt instrument to, to, by industrialized countries to beat down the aspirations of developing countries. Uh, you can always tell in a UN negotiation when the Canadian government official gets up and a diplomat gets up and says, uh, sound science tells us this, or evidence-based decision-making requires this. And you know for sure that there's not going to be a single fact or figure presented after that. It's simply going to be the intonation of these pet phrases, sound science, evidence-based decision making, without any evidence behind it and no soundness to the science. In fact, the sound of science is usually silence. <laughs> and it, it's, uh, and, and it, 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 in developing countries tend to roll their eyes at this because it happens to them all the time and they're put in the position of that they don't know anything, but some other guys who tend to look a lot like me, white-haired, white-skinned, and so on, male, uh, make decisions for them. And I think that's a major problem that we have to face is how science is used as a weapon sometimes against, against uh, the marginalized peoples in the world. And all I can do is be provocative in five minutes, so let me go on to that and say, Three minutes left? Two minutes left? Uh, that, um, in addition, that, that one of the things we used to talk about a lot was the difference between high-tech and wide-tech. Uh, high-tech being, and crudely speaking, where you have a sort of a, a, a micro-innovation which has macro-implications. So what's done in the lab, in fact, could have global impacts, whether we're talking about genomics or we're talking about uh, nanotechnology or whatever, those possibilities where what you've done really has global in uh, considerations. And that's exciting and important. Whereas wide tech is kind of the reverse of that, is where we, uh, or particularly indigenous communities or farming communities, look widely at their their ecosystem environment, their, their wide environment, and then look at sort of micro impacts that they can have on that macro environment. So it's kind of the reverse approach. And the two solitudes don't have to be that, of course. The two solitudes should be working together. There's no reason why they couldn't be and should be. The problem we're faced with in the last couple of decades is the privatization of science and the, the, the constant intonation in the United Nations and I'm in here in Ottawa of public-private partnerships, which usually mean that scientists have to shut up and pay attention to what the private sector is telling them to do 
or, or twisting their results into being something else. And that certainly happens again at the United Nations level. So instead of where we used to say high tech and wide tech, it's more often now hide tech versus wide tech. Whereas the intellectual property controls uh, being applied and the kinds of constraints for what's called restricted business information or confidential business information is such that the science can't come out. It doesn't show up. And that's my time. I'm up. So I wasn't provocative enough. And we have, oh, I have two more minutes. Oh, great. Oh, well, I have nothing to say whatsoever now. So it's, uh, but I'll, I'll struggle on somehow. It's, uh, so we find this consistently in UN negotiations. I was in meetings in Rome a couple of days ago, or a week ago, where uh, we were being told by, strangely, Canada, the United States, and Australia, of all countries, that biofuels were wonderful, and we just didn't sit back and wait for the second or third generation of biofuels, and the hungry just had to wait for dinner a little bit longer, but it would be solved eventually, and so we would be able to feed our cars and our people at the same time. And the constant refrain from Australia, Canada, and the United States was, again, science-based solutions are there, and we will take care of this for you. And almost all the other governments in the room, literally all the other governments in the room, were in shock by this constant refrain to science and a constant assumption that somewhere down the road again, we would have these solutions, which keep on being somewhere down the road. We've been hearing that in UN meetings for eight years now, that round the corner there'll be this next solution. We don't hear the scientific community coming back and responding to that. We hear governments saying it as governments, we don't hear science itself saying, <clears throat> excuse me, but we're finding it a bit harder than we thought it would be. Or, excuse me, uh, we don't really think we're going to get there this way. Or, lunch is really going to be late. That doesn't seem to come out. So we do need to find a different way in which the scientific community can get its voice heard clearly in UN negotiations, not smothered under public-private partnerships or smothered under, again, the weight of a handful of governments who intone on your behalf things which you don't believe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bonsoir tout le monde. Um, thank you very much uh, for putting the table. Uh, I will um, present a little uh, PowerPoint just because I'm, I'm less fluent in English and uh, I'm really sad when I hear uh, <laughs> the way um, the people were speaking uh, before because it's uh, so convincing. So, forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, very fast. Uh, what are we speaking about? Not only STS as we've spoke uh, here during two days, but more relationship between citizens and uh, science, and more specifically, uh, we will say that, about techno-sciences, uh, which is more specific, and I will explain uh, why. Why this emerging agenda? Uh, essentially because uh, there's uh, less confidence in the way the government is uh, dealing with all these issues. Um, an incredible diversity of factors. Uh, the people who are interested in STS are not only the people who are in the community of STS. I was teaching in STS at the University of Quebec 20 years ago, uh, and uh, I continue to do it with a lot of different groups, but not uh, inside this community. Uh, some key question and approach, I will just say a word about uh, some issue in health and environment, because I think they are key questions. Um, and some challenge. So, because I, I don't think I will be able to do it in five minutes. So, I <laughs> go it uh, fast. Um, I think we have to, to change science, which include the social science, human science, uh, engineer science, and all that. And, um, uh, fundamental science, to techno sciences, its market and their relationship to the states. Because I think uh, the major issues for citizens, it's around these issues. And I think uh, Pat Mooney has uh, framed it very clearly. Uh, in reality, the citizens' agenda are generally more global oriented towards concrete questions, especially in the fields of environment, health, and major technological fix sh shift. I'm sorry. Uh, the diversity of the actors, uh, it's just unbelievable how many people are interested in this field right now. And uh, it's sad, uh, I didn't have time to make a map of all these interests, but there's many, many thousands of people. So 
there are some individuals as public servant, as alerteur, I don't know the word in English, uh, as member of citizens group, professional networks. You know, if there's so many people who are uh, organizing themselves, for example, in Canada, you have CAPE, uh, the Canadian Association for of, uh, Physicians for Environment, there are more, more than 5,000. Uh, there's a reason why they are organizing uh, around these issues. And uh, it's the same thing for uh, Council for Responsible Genetics in the United States, Physician for Social Responsibility. And in fact, there's hundred associations like that in the world. Uh, there's also uh, citizens uh, which are becoming sometimes expert citizens in some case, uh, but in large majority they are involved in collaborative national and international networks, for example, science and society and social forums, but there's many, many of them. Um, there's also research project. In Europe, there's a lot of research project uh, which, are which are done by, you have two minutes, Okay, <laughs> and there's also the parliament, and I think uh, the parliament is very, very important. There's real debate uh, at the parliament in Europe, uh, in France, and even at the Senate, uh, uh, Senate in France. Uh, you know, even here, uh, when you remember the time where uh, Willen, for example, were presenting a, a report on agriculture at the Senate, uh, we had these possibilities to have uh, relationship between citizens and um, why they are involving in these issues, uh, essentially when they are really uh, concerned directly. Uh, this is from uh, Nature last week. Uh, it's a new study who showed that uh, for climate change, it will come uh, at least 10 years before, but uh, exactly we're speaking about the poll usually, but it will come, um, uh, dit le Au milieu, là. <laughs> it will come at the equator, mainly. Uh, people who are concerned with uh, extreme events, uh, you have there uh, the evolution of extreme events. Uh, so they have reason to uh, be more interested in that. The way they are thinking about all these questions, it's in relation with ecosystem impairment and health effect. Uh, in Canada, we have done a lot of work on health issues and to reframe uh, health issues. But uh, we, uh, and we have some example in EcoHealth, for example. But IDRC is exporting these ideas uh, outside of Canada. But we don't use that here right now. We, we, we are uh, stuck with old models. Um, Public expenses uh, for long-term health will double uh, in 2050 in OECD countries. So it has to be reduced uh, through prevention. And uh, the great majority of sickness can be prevented, in fact. Here, it's, uh, it's a little map uh, related to a, a book who was just published last week uh, by uh, André Sicolella in France. Uh, you have the increase of cancer and uh, diabetes and CVA. It's just unbelievable because, you know, I even in, in uh, North America, we have uh, one uh, guy on two and one woman on three who will have a cancer during his life. Um, it's a, it's a public health crisis right now that we are facing. We have other data uh, which were published by CDCs on autism, uh, an incredible increase, one children in 88. Uh, it's recent data. Uh, all that to say to you that uh, we always focus on um, um, more of the same, I will say, in health uh, question. And we are thinking that by doing some specific um, work uh, of research related to uh, genetic, for example, uh, it will be better. But we know perfectly well right now that uh, the uh, social determinants of health are related mainly on um, social, les uh, écarts sociaux, on uh, on social gaps and economic gaps mainly and environmental issues uh, and not on healthcare as they are 
uh, developed right now. So we have to reverse the perspective. But we are not in the right way. For example, on uh, nanotechnology, we know for perfectly well that to develop nanomaterials and nano intermediates, uh, we have to have nano enabled products. But nowhere in the world, only in France and since a couple of months only, we have um, obligatory declaration of nanos. Nobody knows what's there. It's impossible to know what kind of object uh, are uh, on the market. Uh, we've done a little uh, research with uh, my students uh, showing that uh, just in one sector where it was supposed to be uh, to have about uh, 100 uh, products um, on a nano, um, uh, uh, nano argent in uh, silver. Si nano silver. In fact, we found uh, more than 500 uh, products, but some of them are uh, baby bottles, uh, and they are produced for more than 80% in uh, China and uh, South Korea. So, uh, and it's just one example, but I think we are not looking always to the good direction. We don't have uh, enough wider perspective. We're not making the links. And we're continuing to, uh, to uh, have um, programs at universities who are uh, um, insisting on uh, the ultra spe specialization uh, when, in fact, we need the specialization of the links between the phenomena. Thank you. Mark and Gordon, I believe this is the time when we, uh, you would be presenting the facts. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to do that. So we will have time for, for more discussion. You can uh, fill the gaps. So it was so uh, draconically close. It uh, must feel strange to only speak for five minutes if normally <laughs> one is asking the keynote address. Um, but thank you for, uh, for accepting it. Uh, so I want to very quickly tell you uh, how we came to the few results we have. Uh, it was relatively difficult to, to come to results. This was a symposium which was deliberately multidisciplinary. Uh, the idea was also to use some bit, you know, experimental methods. The way we did it is we had a series of keynotes and uh, sessions, concurrent sessions. Each of these sessions even the theater piece we had last night, each without exception, had a rapporteur. And everybody was told at the beginning that this symposium question should be somehow addressed, even only very briefly. And the rapporteurs had the same challenge. They had to summarize the results from that light. Now, this is actually, it turns out, quite hard uh, because uh, I guess a lot of academics are trained to hunt the next research question, a question rather than an answer, or perhaps when this is really legitimate, to specialize on asking critical questions. There's, there's no one in the academic world who would disagree that finding an important question uh, is, is a great value, but we try to get a little bit further. So we do have a few um, results. We did at the end of, of before you came, we put all these sheets that the rapporteurs uh, produced. We put them down for a little voting exercise. It was a bit hard to do. We learned from this process, uh, some of the handwriting and, and so on. But we have some results from that. I also did some kind of an open session. And uh, it was late in the day. I think people want to go to the pub. But I said, what should we do? You know, what are the action items that you can identify after two days of thinking? So let me just read to you a few here. One was. Uh, to be proactive about technological foresight. That was a theme which came up, and that was, I think, also br brought up by you. Uh, there, is, there was a lot of attention on, on the issue of the audience. So I believe that is, it may be obvious, but it was also really shown in some of the activities today that understanding the audience is key. And it's maybe an important nuance to accept that when you say communication, this is almost like at the end of the process. First, you know the audience, and then 
once you understand the audience, maybe then you use your communication skills, or then you learn how to communicate. So uh, this was brought up by, by you and, and also by the workshop uh, symposium participants. At the, I also left a pen behind and allowed people who didn't want to speak up to write down uh, on the sheet. Someone wrote, graduate and postdoc training needs reform to serve the needs of society and act as vehicles of innovation, and also a point on uh, engagement with scientists. Uh, I want to, to, before I give the word to Gordon, to explain to you what came out of this voting exercise. I just want to take my privilege here and, and give you a personal impression of what, what I learned. The first thing I learned is, is that people in our profession, science and technology studies, or history and philosophy of science and technology, we have the same communication challenge as the scientists. Normally, it, the focus is on the natural scientists. People say, oh, these people live in laboratories, and they don't get out much. And then when they have access to power, they're so shocked. They don't know what to do. My personal impression is this is not restricted to natural scientists. So we have a lot to learn there. That is learnable. So there is actually an actionable item there. I would say the second point has to do with teamwork and openness. We did expose people to occasionally to very different settings, different disciplines. And the, my impression was that the first thing to overcome is sort of an emotional reaction. If your own uh, teachings, your own beliefs are questioned, if you're very intelligent, you're very insensitive, the first thing is you know, pain. Uh, that, that creates a barrier. That needs to be overcome. And it needs to go towards respect. I think that's quite important. Last point, the status of experts and expertise is worrying, I believe, a lot of people. And when we get asked to be more practical, more practice-oriented, I think it feels to some people like sophistry to be so focused on the needs of the audience. It's like selling out. How can we take such a complex issue and packed it in five minutes, it's ridiculous. And this is maybe a general problem of the world, is that we are going from respect for experts to Twitter messages. Uh, I don't know the solution for that. It's my personal view that this was there for two days. Yeah. So Gordon, would you like to yeah. give more results, please? And so I can give some results. Can I use this podium to put my paper down, if sure. you could? Uh, some of the results and what people were interested in. Now, this is marked as low-hanging fruit, this session, but some of these are very high. And I hope that we, maybe in the discussion, that we can pull the branches down a bit so, and uh, nibble at them at uh, a level of practicality in deciding what we might do. Um, amongst all of the discussions and presentations, that people tend to concentrate their interest on a few. And I will just... Um, uh, summarize them. Of course, everybody seemed to like the notion of using the play Copenhagen as a cultural artifact to open up issues of, uh, um, of science and society, the nature of science, creativity, ethics, and politics. And there seemed to be a, a general sort of um, uh, refreshing nature of uh, looking at a play and then having a set of experts from different perspectives analyze what that play might mean historically, but also what it might tell us about the uh, future of the relationship of science, technology, and society. But most of the cluster of uh, interest seemed to be um, landing right on the idea of responsible innovation and that the kinds of government challenges are now unique and cannot be met by traditional government regimes. So it, it seems to be a new playing field, not only climate change, uh, nanotechnology, uh, the possibility of gene therapy, all of these are opening up new ways of being that are not to be reduced down to the traditional governmental regimes. As much that we're interested in that, we are interested in G uh, Yves Gingras' take on the construction, his worry that there was a construction of a new social contract that seemed to uh, circumvent or uh, circumnavigate uh, our um, uh, previously established 
uh, governance structure, uh, structures that went from a citizenry to re uh, representative uh, government through various um, agencies of funding and planning down to the practice of science. And that some kind of um, roundabout route was moving directly from political uh, rep representatives to the actual funding straight of science, controlling of the nature of the way science was moving. Equal number of people that liked Yves Gingras's take on this were also uncomfortable with his critique of citizen science, which uh, is part of that story, that citizen science seems to want to elevate the uh, aspect of uh, the direct participation of citizenry in the nature of science. So it's interesting that it was a balance between uh, 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 agreeing with uh, Yves Gingras' worry about the new social contract and also uh, disagreeing with his worry about citizen science. Many of you uh, seem to uh, be interested in the notion of education and culture, especially the ongoing efforts to improve the science curricula and introduce in the science curricula multiple perspectives. That is, uh, two aspects of scientific uh, education uh, people seem to uh, be emphasizing in their votes. One was that science curricula could not merely uh, be emphasizing the um, results of science, but looking at the scientific method itself and giving uh, students, uh, both at the lower levels and the higher levels, a more critical encounter with what it might mean to be science, and that it might be a form of uh, organized skepticism or a type of methodology of encountering facts, which, uh, which uh, you've already emphasized, does not give us absolute certainty, and that we should not panic when somebody says you are uncertain. Um, the, uh, a fair number of you seem to be interested in um, the uh, understanding of the economy of fundamental research. And this leads back to the strong emphasis on uh, that we can no longer remain under the present traditional government regimes, that a new ecology of fundamental research had to be explored or at least uh, examined in its present state. That is, the distribution uh, within civil society and research of the responsibilities between universities, uh, federal agencies, and the private sector. Um, ma uh, many of you also seem to be f uh, uh, favorable to the discussion of science and democracy and the call for the understanding of what scientific expertise actually is. And then the large majority uh, um, uh, pointed towards uh, the idea that we had to get rid of the notion that science is value-free, that it's a value-free, totally uh, mechanical algorithm that moves towards this thing called objectivity. And that, I think, summarizes all the other questions, although its fruit is so high that we can almost not reach it. That? Yeah. Thank you, Gordon. And uh, I would like perhaps to give an opportunity to our panelists to uh, respond uh, perhaps for a few minutes to uh, some of those statements. And then we can engage with your questions uh, uh, following those uh, observations. So, Denise, uh, do you want to start? Or can you? Uh, of course. Yes. I'm you. Hey. Start by the name. Um, OK. Um, two points. Uh, the first one, I, and I'll start by one of the first points that was mentioned, multidisciplinary, and I'll share a story with you. Uh, I studied uh, in biology here at Ottawa University, and I focused on ecology. And at the time, ecology was quite new, and it was the art of the holistic approach, if you want, okay? where, where you talk about all the disciplines. And uh, two things happened. About maybe 20 years after, I was uh, working at Natural Resources Canada. And uh, I'm visiting the research uh, part where they do research on mining. And uh, they explained to me what they were doing with the tailings. 
you know, the tailings, the, the leftover, if you want, after you have extracted the mineral. And I looked at it and I said, hey, this is what we do use in water treatment. And this is something I had studied 20 years before when I was studying in ecology and that we had visited a water treatment place where you treat water, you know, from sewage to water. It was the exact same principle that was being used. The reasons why I share that story is because this was seen as a big invention. And wow, we're doing all those things that way. And I thought, my God, if people would have talked to each other before from different disciplines, they could have found and solved the problem of tailings 20 years ago. So that's one of the problems that I see in science. And I was lucky because in my own career, I, I've worked in multidisciplinary field all the time. Or when they were not, I was pushing for that. And if I have an advice for you uh, as you, you, you continue your work or your career, is always try to talk to people from other disciplines. Because often that's when you see the solutions that you have not seen before. And try to find, because we talked about communications also, try to find interpreters that to check if what you're talking about, if people will understand. And I'll give an example that we used when I was working at the museum. And because, you, you know, you have these notions of expertise status. And we were trying to explain to people uh, that every, every individual was producing one ton of CO2 a day. Try to explain what is one ton of CO2 a day. So people, you know, we were trying to explain it. So finally, the team came up with this huge, I don't even know how to call it, I'll call it a ballon, a balloon, um, that was literally what was one ton of CO2 a day. And when the team did that, and they explained to people that this was what every human being in Canada was producing a day of CO2. And then people got it. They said, what? Even the staff, they were each time, I remember each time I was going in front of that, you know, I was more careful with my use of what, what I was using during the day because I almost had remorse. Because for the first time in my life, I was seeing what, what was one ton of CO2. So I'll stop here. Oh, we still go in the same order. Well, but well, he speaks longer, eh? <laughs> you have to watch it. I'll poke him. I'll poke him. Thank you, Denise. Um, I, I, let me say a couple of things. Uh, the first thing, I guess, is the theme that Gordon mentioned about the critique of science training. And having been in the business of training students in science for 27 years now, uh, I agree absolutely with this. We, we do a very, very, very poor job of, stu of training students, even in science, let alone in non-science, in the method of science. We, we focus almost exclusively on the product and not on the process. And this has two distinctly unsalutary consequences. The first is that many, many science students and, as a consequence, practicing scientists do not understand, really, the limitations of their science. That's problem number one. Problem number two is exactly this theme that I think has already been discussed during the conference, and that is the vast majority of scientists do not understand the extent to which their science is impregnated by Normal, um, normative issues. And in fact, if I can, I've just finished contributing to a, a manual uh, for Canada's judiciary on the interpretation of scientific evidence in the courtroom. And uh, this is a theme that I explore in excruciating detail because it is critically important for judges who are faced with making, uh, handing down decisions on issues where science is at the core of the issue, 
uh, that they actually be able to dissect out those normative elements of scientific evidence versus the non-normative. Of course, they're inextricably linked. But this is something that most scientists actually don't even understand. And it gets them into all sorts of difficulty. And it contributes to something that I think is pervasive, the scientific hubris. I fully subscribe to the view that, uh, that effective democracies depend on the open and transparent communication of scientific information. The architect of the Constitution of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, noted very, very well. He said that in, democracy depends on an informed public. And you don't have an informed public, you don't have a functioning democracy. End of story, full stop. And science is the best way that we can inform the public and do it in a legitimate fashion if we acknowledge the limitations of science. There's all sorts of issues to which science fundamentally cannot speak. I'm going to stop there and give the lie to Denise's comment. <laughs> okay. I'll still need help to be told when I should stop. But uh, the uh, I guess. One of the comments that, that was suggested from your discussions was that uh, uh, knowing who your audience is, and, and of course that's always true, but I would want to argue that scientists need to spend more time in the audience uh, trying to see the world from a different perspective. And scientists, I think, do find that hard to do. Most of the experiences I've had with participatory research programs, uh, usually around agriculture, it somehow turns out to be, despite everybody's good intentions, that the scientists end up looking upon the farmers as cheap labor to help conduct their research. Uh, interesting, anecdotally charming, um, but not. But there's still cheap labor for someone else's really directed research, and it's very hard to get out of that mold. So I think it's a real struggle to do it, and and I sympathize with you having trouble doing it. But it, there's got to be some ways to work at it. Then I'd like to pose really a, a, a specific example of where I find uh, there's a real problem in how to sort out what the role of science is. That's around the issue now with climate change, uh, where you saw in the report that came out September 27th in Stockholm in the first round of, of reports from the first working group, where the last bullet talked about the need to understand geoengineering better, uh, planetary manipulations, how do we adjust the thermostat of the planet. And uh, that's going to appear in the next in the other working groups as well. Working groups two and three all have big sections in them on geoengineering. And it makes perfect sense. In a sane and reasonable world, we would say, given what our politicians aren't doing, and given the crisis that we are in around climate change, then logically, scientists should be looking at a plan B, some way in which scientists can step in in a crisis and adjust the planet's thermostat in some way to, to make sure we survive uh, what's coming at us so quickly. And therefore, the research needs to be done now. We need to be ready to, to move into that, that unacceptably bad mode, but still one we may have to consider of taking on the manipulations of planetary systems. Makes sense. David Keith, who used to be at Calgary, is now at Harvard. People like Ken Kildare at, at, at uh, Carnegie Mellon and many others are moving very rapidly. And we're seeing now research proposals. And I was in Germany a few days ago in Germany and Sweden and Belgium in the, in the EU looking now at how do we, do we scale up our research on geoengineering. That's usually solar radiation management, or it's sometimes a few leftover people think about ocean fertilization as a possibility. Most have given up on that one. But still, solar radiation management. Well, again, it makes perfect sense. It's reasonable. Except that once the notion is on the table that, you can, that geoengineering is a possibility, it enters into a political environment. And all the well-meaning scientists who say, we're just trying to do our job because we know the governments aren't, have to realize that what's on the table then is a whole range of options because there isn't a consensus. I've seen 22 different computer models of what would happen if you use solar radiation management of different kinds. And the, the politicians are left with a wonderful smorgasbord of things they can do from that range of scientific options. All that's happened from the process of scientific uh, investigation is that the politicians have be, are given a way out. We don't really have to do the hard job, the hard heavy lifting of social policy and really making changes to our, to our, to our industry or to our societies. All we, we can just pick out 
the scales and levers and, me and, and measurements that we want to from the smorgasbord of options and, and tell our, 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 our societies, relax, we've got a solution for you. And solar radiation management is cheap, really quite cheap, in fact. It works, we know that. Uh, it's, not high, it's not hard or, or high tech at all. It's pretty straightforward. And, and so it can be done. And it gets politicians through the next election. So the moment reasonable scientists lay out these options on the table, they lose complete control of where it goes from there. It immediately becomes an issue strictly of, of letting, letting the, the politicians cherry pick whatever solutions they want to at whatever price they'd like to. And that can't be controlled. So the idea that scientists might have that their reasonableness, that their openness to debate and, and discussion and so on can actually be managed in some way that politicians will pay attention is simply sweet naivety. That will not happen, absolutely guaranteed. So the only real issue then for scientists perhaps is to say we recognize all of this and the issue on the table is governance. The issue on the table is how do the nations of the world adjust this question, address this question? How do scientists speak to the nations of the world saying, folks, you've got a problem here, and really letting one country go it alone or creating a new coalition of the willing of a handful of countries who will do geoengineering on behalf of the rest of us, as, for example, in the Cold War with nuclear testing, uh, where some countries felt very able to speak on behalf of the rest of us and, ex and experiment on the behalf of the rest of us. Instead of doing that, scientists have to address the problem here isn't a scientific problem. The problem here is a political problem of global governance. And I don't know how scientists get around to doing that because all I come across is, the, is David and Ken and people like that who are really simply talking about their models and not recognizing that they really won't control the results of their research. Thank you. Can't resist and being close to a microphone, mentioning the analogy to the play that we were exposed to last night on Copenhagen and the, uh, the Cold War and the nuclear uh, situation. And uh, the question uh, that uh, Pat Mooney is asking is uh, the social responsibility of uh, scientists also, which is a major question. Um, I think w when we're speaking about science and democracy, one of the first thing is uh, not to ask to whom we have to speak, but what we have to say and uh, why we think that we have to say so much, because sometimes to listen to them, it's really better. Uh, and it, it's not just to, uh, to play with words when I'm saying that. Uh, the co-construction of knowledge, it's something very important. And uh, when we're speaking a, about citizens, we're speaking about people from all the constituency and from different perspective and from different uh, um, uh, education also. Uh, I think it's very, very important. I think also that when we're speaking about sciences, we have to be very clear that we're speaking about all sciences and we have to include also all knowledge. Um, when we are speaking about all sciences, it's essentially because right now one of the major question, uh, it's not only the governance, but it's also the framing of the problems everywhere. And uh, I think if there's a role for social sciences and humanities, it's to work at the level of framing the problems and to work with scientists on these issues at this level, not only to be instrumentalized as uh, sociologists, for example, will do a little inquiry after the fact uh, just to uh, add uh, a surplus d'âme, as we say in French. Uh, I don't know how to translate that. I leave it to you. Um, so. It's important to reframe the debate, and it's also important to work with people. And uh, I was in France uh, two, two weeks ago uh, in a major conference on co city, uh, city and uh, climate change and environmental issues. And it was um, um, at the end, we had uh, a major mayor's um, forum with uh, more than 250 mayors in the world. And uh, one of the uh, political power, which is very, very important now on all these issues, it's the cities. And the mayors are, uh, are playing a very interesting role in all these issues. And frankly, uh, being in an academic uh, context all year, um, I can tell you that um, one of the major um, 
problem that we have as academic, and uh, I say that to the students all the time because we have students from all the um, disciplines. It's very, not only interdisciplinary, but intersectorial. So we have people from biology uh, to uh, philosophy and uh, many, many people were on the workforce before. And one of the problem that we face, it's all the education systems tell you that you're the best, the best one, the more brightest, but to do interdisciplinary. T. <laughs> we need to uh, say that we don't know. And we have to uh, improve collectively the way that we uh, have to face the problems that are collective problems. And when I was speaking about health problems or, uh, you know, it's just example. We, we can have uh, tons of examples, but we're facing right now some people who still think that there's a technological fix uh, solution for everything. Doesn't matter what is the technological solution that we will present to the public, that we will force to the public. Uh, the democratization of science and technology is not just wording. It's uh, essential. Thank you. Merci. Uh, now, so it's the time for the room to uh, express any questions or comments to our panelists. So we have questions, so that's good. So we'll use the microphone because the session is being recorded. Sure, OK. Um, <clears throat> I, I thought this was a fantastic uh, discussion. I was particularly pleased with the attempt to address the issue of the public and uh, framing the problem. Uh, I, I think that's essential. But I think in some respects, maybe that's where sometimes debates like this completely miss the boat, um, particularly if we're what we've not addressed, and I, I apologize because maybe Yves Gingras raised this on the first day, I wouldn't doubt, but I wasn't here, so. Uh, the ideology where a marketplace actually decides uh, what, then the scientific research that gets done sometimes is narrow, narrowly oriented toward the economy or the investment, if you can put it that way, certainly to the practical. Um, I'm wondering whether or not, if anybody would like to comment on whether a debate on public policy is really fruitful without comprehending uh, the orientation or, or the ideology of what public, or more likely, more particularly, public interest really does mean. So we have examples of disputes over the effects of, say, nanotechnology, uh, global warming, whatever, uh, that really has to confront market-driven science. Uh, Scott raised a very interesting uh, example of Jefferson, you know, the great Enlightenment figure raising the problem of the informed public, but I would think one might address that even more broadly. That is defining or informing what a public interest really is. Anyone with good I'll try that one. Um, One, um, you know, a lot of people are afraid of science. Um, and that's why they didn't go in science when they, were young, when they were teenagers or when they were adults. They were just afraid of science. And that's why also many elementary teachers don't teach science, because they are afraid of science. That's why they went into elementary education. And unfortunately, there are many journalists that are the same. And who reads newspaper? It's the public. Who reads news? It's the public. And unfortunately, the journalists don't understand the science very often. And I'll share something that I've heard um, about three years ago when the new Science Media Center was uh, 
created here in uh, for Canada. And uh, it was following the establishment of a science media center that was established in England because there were problems with respect to the public not understanding the science. What happened is that uh, the journalist didn't understand what was genetically modified food. So there were those images, front page of newspaper with literally frank, franken food, if you want, and things that, you know, just to af uh, afraid, um, frighten people. Uh, same thing happened with BSC. Suddenly, there were a lot of people not eating beef be because they were just afraid. And it even had repercussions here in Canada. When in fact, yes, BSC is very serious, but guess what? The likelihood of having one animal affected by BSC was relatively low, in fact, very low, both in UK and also in Canada. My point with respect to your point is that very often, first people talk about things that they don't know, and they think they know, so they begin to make you believe certain things. And in fact, they really don't know, but that sells. And nobody talked about the role of media here today. And for me, that's a critical element when we begin to talk about science. Uh, just looked by curiosity, those of you that still buy newspaper, because I know quite a few uh, go web now, but if you just buy a couple of newspaper for a week, just calculate the number of articles related to science compare to other types of articles. And you'll see that, in fact, we are not helping ourselves. So I just want to make another link to something that I've heard that there was a dissension uh, with respect to citizen science should, you know, is it good, is it not good? I think personally, if we do not do citizen science, we're making a mistake because often it is a way to help people to understand science and to begin to be curious, to take uh, Pat's comment from the, the beginning, and to, to want to know more about something. And so that's why there are roles of people. I'm going back to my notions of interpreters that I was mentioning uh, earlier. And so you need to have people that help other people to understand science. I think those are important points, but I, I think that on the BSE question, I think the reason why people talked about things they didn't know was because previously with, with mad cow disease, or not mad cow disease, with, with hoof and mouth disease, um, uh, scientists didn't talk about things they did know. And that, that was the problem in the UK. And so there was a distrust of the scientific community for having been quiet. And, and the repercussions of that are being paid for now. So I, I wouldn't blame citizens for that. I would say that that was the... Uh, yeah. why the Science Media Center was created to ensure that there were lists of scientists that could explain, in fact, what was happening. Can, oh. okay, go ahead. Oh. Perhaps I can, and this is something about which I know almost nothing, but when we talk about the public interest, I'm curious that we use the definite article, because it seems to me that actually if we talk about the interests of the public we would be would be or publics we would be further ahead so of course those interests are related to value so when we talk when i think of of science in the public interest i think of science whether it's prosecuted by academic scientists whether it's prosecuted by industry whether it's prosecuted by the government it's science that relates to the sustaining of those interests of the public which relate to values. So economic opportunities are certainly things that people value. Cultural values, environmental, you know, the environment, human health. To me, that's, that's really what science in the interests of the public is that speaks to the plurality of values. And the issue about whether only some of those values can, can be the target of 
uh, government research or academic research or business research, you know, I could imagine that you could have privatized research that deals with any of those sets of values. I don't see that there's anything intrinsic about those sets of values or interests that means you got to do it on the public dime versus on the corporate dime. Perhaps it's just ignorance on my part, but I don't actually see it. Um, just to continue on these uh, issues, um, when we say uh, the public don't know, uh, I remember how many uh, articles I've seen about uh, GMOs and the public don't know how to produce GMOs and because they don't know this technical uh, fact, so they don't know GMOs at all. Uh, but I would like to know uh, who knows in uh, this room that um, who control the seeds in the world right now? How many firms control the seeds market? Right now, it, it was in uh, eight, 96, three firms were controlling 22%. Right now, it's three firms who are controlling 50% of the seeds. Uh, 54. <laughs> yes, it, it's even worse. Um, and in fact, um, the, the people knows pretty well that, uh, first of all, the, the seeds, the, the, uh, the, the, the GMOs right now that we have, it's uh, four products, uh, essentially uh, maïs and soja, um, that there's one threat, then there's one function, it's pesticide pump. And this pesticide pump, it's essentially Roundup. And Roundup is known right now. There's at least 30 different studies on that. It's now known as an endocrine disruptor. So what are we doing in this country and in the United States and everywhere with uh, this large distribution of an endocrine disruptor when we know how much endocrine disruptor are involved in the increase of cancer, for example, to name just this one. So it's one example of uh, you know, people are realize, realizing uh, the concentration of power uh, around these things. They are realizing a lot of things, but w the question that we're asking to them, it's, do you know this technical thing? No, they don't use to, but they understand quite well uh, their interest and uh, who's the interest uh, related to this product or this orientation or this misinformation of the public. Uh, and I think it's very important to, uh, to separate those things. And I'm not saying that there's no work of uh, dissemination of information and uh, sharing of information and museums, and, you know, but I'm saying that right now there's a lot of uh, people who are knowing really more what's going on uh, than we are thinking that they are knowing. There are four more questions in the room, so what I suggest, because we have limited time, we'll take two questions, we'll ask you to answer either one of the two questions, and then we'll uh, proceed with the next question. So, question is from the far back. Yes, thank you. This is a question coming from a member of the live stream audience, who is a graduate student at the Faculty of Education in Marwa. The question is, does the panel think teachers have a role in popularizing science? And as a sub-question, why don't scientists go to schools and cooperate with teachers to communicate the science to the students and improve science literacy. Thank you. So you've noted the question, and then I'll move on to our next question. Um, I'm deeply concerned with the governance issue, particularly when we're talking about things like solar radiation management and um, synthetic biofuels, as if these are solutions when they may be potential solutions from a scientific perspective, but in terms of how they might be appropriated politically or what their broad impact might be, either of these could be greater disasters in the problems they're meant to solve. And I wondered if we could hear a little bit more in terms of how to move forward on that governance concern. Thank you. Uh, which one of our panelists would like to start? Okay, I, w I will go with the first one, the first question. Um, 
I think the first question was, uh, is there a role for teachers to teach science and uh, why scientists don't go in school? Uh, first, yes, there's an absolute role for teachers to teach science, even though they are not into the science class. Um, because some of you talked about the process of science. In fact, when you buy a car, when you buy a new iPhone, an iPad, you use the process of science in order to decide which uh, of the iPhone or the iPad or the car that uh, you, will, you will buy. So it is essential because it helps people to have critical thinking and to uh, be able to question what there is and be curious also. Uh, they are scientists in schools. In fact, uh, they are probably uh, scientists from Ottawa universities that go in school. They are partnerships. They are uh, scientists that go in museums also. They are scientists uh, like partners in research that do it either virtually or in person. So, in fact, there are a number of scientists uh, that do that and love to do this. And the question is that are teachers taking advantage of it as often as uh, they should? Um, so, and especially if they are afraid of science, they there are so many uh, ways that they can teach and receive help to teach science. So, well, on, on the um, is it on? Is it on? Yes, on uh, the issue of, of solar radiation management and, and geoengineering, um, the struggle now, frankly, is to have it debated in the United Nations, and there is some appetite for that among governments. Uh, I hope it will be debated in the next few months. There are discussions going on in a few locations uh, already, at a, at, not at the level of the General Assembly, but at the level of, of international negotiations. So that uh, next uh, June in Montreal, June 24 to 27, there'll be a, a conference, uh, which is the scientific subcommittee of the Biodiversity Convention, will be looking at geoengineering. Uh, and especially at solar radiation management. And that's a, meeting, that's a meeting of scientists from 193 countries. So it'll be there for debate. There is a moratorium now in the United Nations against geoengineering, but a moratorium is a very weak form of law. And so it really needs to be more into the General Assembly. There is a treaty uh, that was uh, adopted in 1978 by governments way, way back, which was called an Environmental Modification Treaty in which governments, including Canada and the United States, uh, most major governments uh, signed the treaty, it's legally binding, which committed them to not doing geoengineering, basically. Uh, but it's been ignored. And so the issue is to get that back on the table and to have the discussion. Again, the issue is really, first of all, to discuss governance. Secondly, it's the governments, governments then and their societies can decide what they want to do about it. But uh, at least it has to be out on the table. Our alarm is that we are seeing China talking with the United States, talking with Russia, especially those countries, about how they could do it themselves without discussing it with the rest of the world. And uh, I would just would like to add that when we are speaking about governance, I think we really have to look to uh, the uh, economical the economic interest uh, related to that. Uh, in nanotechnology, for example, at least half of the money who was um, um, was used uh, to develop nanotechnology is public funds. Um, and we have to understand that, for example, uh, the lack of control and uh, the lack of uh, rules around uh, not only GMOs, but also pharmacultures in, in North America, and also uh, nanotechnology now, uh, it's related to some postulate, which are not scientific, which are economic. It's grass, generally recognized as safe, at the first instance, and after that, uh, the principle of uh, equivalence. Uh, you know, uh, I cannot understand how much is so different that it has to be patent, but not enough different to be the object of real um, uh, analysis and uh, assessment. You have the last one. No, no, I don't know. Okay, I will take a question here, but before I pass the microphone, uh, there's a lot of young people, people that are probably less than my age, and <laughs> in the room that are students themselves, and then I'd like to hear from one of you at least, uh, I mean, what does this all say to you? I mean, you've heard a lot about even questioning on the validity of science teaching. 
uh, and the, uh, I mean, all of these issues and problems in science in general, is this something that scares you or is it something that excites you to be engaged in? So I'd like to come back to either one of you to actually get a, an impression on that, but I'll uh, go to this question first. Yeah, so yeah, it does scares me quite a lot. And so let me try to do this in some ways. So is, is, is it, so my concern is that perhaps we're setting up ourselves to what might be an impossible task. So on the one hand, we have this sort of um, hope that if only we could sort of make this insti the, the current institutionalization of science more transparent, if only science were you know, honest and our public was better informed, and sophisticated in terms of understanding the sort of the methodological assumptions that often go in, the values that, 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 go, that go in directly and indirectly. Um, if we had better mechanisms in place for disclosing uh, important aspects of, of the scientific findings and that sort of thing would have a sort of a better way of, of making this interplay. But what, what, what I'm concerned with, and I, and I think this, is, it didn't really come up in, this, in the symposium. I, I, yeah, so that perhaps what we're dealing with is this sort of inherent limitation of the science per se. So the problem is with science, of the way of communicating what a scientific findings, results really are. I mean, it's easier if, if I contextualize this. Here's a domain that I'm familiar with. I mean, take, take, take the domain of clinical trials. Okay, so here, you know, going along with what Scott was saying, which we sort of resonated with me, right? I mean, it's all music to my ears. Communicating is crucial, the importance of evidence, and sort of, you know, revealing out the sort of the values, right? They, they are, they're, they're embedded there. So here are, you have a group of experts who are making a decision about the best ways of sort of designing a study for finding whether a drug does what it's supposed to do and it's safe in the ways that we think, we hope that it is. And there is a certain strategy for monitoring it and, and, and making decisions. Closed rooms about, is this enough evidence? Is not enough evidence? Does, this, does the, you know, the current Efficacy outweigh the possible, uh, you know, long-term side effects of these drugs. I mean, these are these are value judgments, make behind you know closed doors. But at the end of the day, I mean, this is sort of a science that I mean, there are sciences in science, but in this particular context, I mean, this is a science on a clock. People have to make a decision. We're running out of time, right? We are constrained by financial resources, so well, make a decision. But the way we the way we express these scientific results, right, the, the evidence for the drug, the way they are published, these values are lost. We, you cannot, how, how could you possibly express these, this sort of judgment call? So if that is a limitation of science per se, so perhaps this isn't this maybe a, an invitation for maybe rethinking about a different, a different form of science or something like that. So before I ask our panelists to do a closing statement, because we, unfortunately the time is over, I'm just asking anybody else wants to. Uh, st uh, oh, to <laughs> this may go a little bit along with what you were saying, but I'm taking the opposite view. And a few of us were talking about this yesterday, and um, basically, I feel that there are. From, I'm a PhD student, and many of the scientists that I see that are my supervisors or colleagues, we're, we have a lot on our plates. There's a lot going on in your day to day just to get your research ready to publish, and the research cycle in itself is often a full load. And that's at a PhD level, and I'm only working on one project. I can't imagine what a research scientist, how his day looks or her day looks, where you're just flooded with things to do, and for us to then go and become experts of policy and learn a different language is sometimes a tall, a tall task, I think. I've, because some of my research sort of is in the climate science realm, I've often been asked, well, what, what does it mean to policy? And I can't answer that question. I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it, trying to look at freshwater policy and trying to see how my little algal biomonitoring research could fit into that. But in a big policy sense, sometimes it's really difficult. And I, and I guess my question is, is, is the onus just on scientists or is it also on policymakers to form a bridge, a toolkit to talk to each other? I don't, 
they we're operating in silos, and one says, well, I don't understand you, and the other, I'm sure, doesn't understand them. So it can't just be one person's problem. It has to be both, I think. Our collective problem. I'll take a last comment here, and then we'll close. Thank you. Uh, I feel that uh, the main problem is that we compart compartmentalize subjects. And when we say that we, it's science, it has to be maths or physics or chemistry. I could be teaching civics or history, and I could be teaching science exactly. in a scientific way. I could be uh, inculcating creativity. I could be uh, encouraging questioning. I could uh, follow all the process, the methods of science. So, and, and that's the reason in society, I've, it's not, uh, I've been teaching in India for 20 years, and here too I've seen that uh, there is a prestige about certain subjects, and there is a, a kind of feeling, oh, you're taking this, where would, where would this road lead to? It's no, you, you've not uh, taken the right subject. So I thought it was different here, but it's, it's, it's the same thing. So it's because we think that science, is, uh, science rests only in physics or chemistry. So it could be, I could be teaching English, and I could be uh, a science teacher. I could teach it in a scientific way. So I think if that, if you, if you want that uh, a holistic approach, it's very important that uh, society and science, I, I can see science in everything, whether it could be my belief, it could be my religion, it could be uh, a superstition or my way of living, praying, uh, exercise, eating, it's everywhere, science is everywhere. So I see it that way, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let's take a last one. So I know there was a question about what are the students thinking, what are the new up-and-coming scientists thinking. Um, I'm a fourth-year student at Ottawa U. I've actually taken a class with Dr. Finley, and I'm taking a class right now designed by Dr. Finley. Um, and I can say that all of this seems very exciting. It's a whole new discipline, I think, within science that kind of allows you to be creative. In my first and second year in science, l learning at Ottawa U, I found the amount of data you were receiving was overwhelming, and the way the curriculum was set up was just, it almost crushed my interest in science and my amazement in science and my wonder in science. And I think the great thing about getting the ball rolling on science communication is it opens up a new door for kids who are interested in science but don't want to actually study pure science. They want to study how can we make science cooler? How can we make it cool? How can we make it creative? How can we show the wonder we feel in science to the world? And I think that this is a really amazing kind of discussion panel. It gets people thinking about science as a part of your life and how you can share it with others. That's it. Thank you so much. Um, now, closing statement, I suggest that we go reverse order of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So perhaps in a van lake you could start. Thank <laughs> you. Um, uh, I just um, would like to come back to, to the comment uh, which was done, um, which seems to be um, quite interesting. And uh, you know, I, I think one of the problems is the kind of glass that we wear. Um, in economy, for example, we still have glasses uh, looking to the economy with uh, PNB. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, I was speaking about glasses that we wear. And in fact, we don't have uh, the good glasses, you know. Uh, it's impossible in, in an economy in, uh, on Earth where we have limits uh, to have uh, this impression and this dream that uh, there's no limits uh, for, the, uh, for the development. Uh, and PNB, it's no more uh, the right uh, lens that we have to use. Uh, I think it's the same thing in medicine. For example, we, we were speaking about evidence. Uh, but in some uh, sectors, it's not so simple. For example, endocrine disruptor, uh, which is related to our future, because uh, we know, for example, uh, that uh, spermatogen is uh, as um, uh, de moitié. Um, 
the, the low sperm count uh, is, uh, yeah, cut by half at least. Uh, so, uh, and we, we know all the effects on cancer and on a lot of uh, different things. But it's not uh, the poison which make, uh, you know, as we know usually in... Um, oh, je peux pas continuer en français un peu? <laughs> Just two minutes, because really... No, not two minutes. One second, one second. We know now that on the issue of perturbateurs endocrinians, it's the window of exposition that counts. It's not necessarily the... Le, le fait euh, d'être euh, hautement contaminé. On sait même qu'au niveau des données statistiques, que c'est complètement erratique, que des doses très, très faibles de quelques parties par trillion peuvent avoir un impact au niveau du développement embryonnaire. Or, les lunettes habituelles qu'on a en médecine ne permettent pas de voir ça. De la même façon, au Canada, on a énormément de gens qui souffrent de problèmes d'hypersensibilité chronique. Or, il y a quelques médecins de l'Association des médecins de famille en Ontario qui travaillent là-dessus. Mais au Québec, Impossible. Les gens sont malades, font en moyenne 28 visites de médecins avant d'avoir un diagnostic parce qu'ils ne connaissent pas euh, ce type de problèmes-là qui sont liés à euh, ce qu'on appelle « chemical sensitivity hein, », un des problèmes d'hypersensibilité chimique, mais c'est un ensemble de, euh, euh, je dirais de problèmes de santé euh, aux causes multiples. Et il n'y a même pas moyen de faire des projets de recherche là-dessus. Parce que euh, du côté des IRSC, on vous dit, ah ben oui, mais euh, ça n'existe pas vraiment encore. Le Collège des médecins, vous allez voir le ministère, le Collège des médecins n'a pas décrété que ça existait, donc vous ne pouvez pas faire de recherche là-dessus. Euh, du côté des organismes en sciences humaines, ils disent, ben non, surtout pas, on n'a tellement pas d'argent, on ne va pas faire de recherche sur des questions de santé, c'est trop santé. Euh... <rire> Et si, par malheur, vous êtes en sciences humaines et que vous travaillez avec des équipes de médecins, mais que vous lidez la recherche, alors là, c'est un crime de lèse-majesté. Bref, euh, puis si vous le faites avec des citoyens, en plus, qui sont les premiers concernés, qui ont été les alerteurs sur ce dossier-là, ah ben là, euh, on vous dit qu'il faut faire une recherche coopérative, collaborative, qu'il faut faire de la co-construction des savoirs, mais euh, on va vous mettre tous les bâtons dans les roues. Donc, il euh, y a vraiment des problèmes de lunettes. Et ces problèmes de lunettes, ils sont très largement partagés au niveau des organismes subventionnaires. Il euh, n'y a presque pas de lieu pour faire de la recherche intersectorielle véritablement, sans instrumentaliser une discipline par un autre. Et il est, à mon avis, absolument impossible que, par exemple, au Canada, j'avais beaucoup insisté au Québec pour que ça se fasse. Ils ont ouvert un tout petit créneau, minuscule, mais quand même, ça a le bonheur d'exister, pour des recherches novatrices, euh, pour des recherches qui ne seraient pas subventionnées ailleurs, mais qui portent sur des questions qui sont socialement importantes, euh, qui peuvent euh, conduire à autre chose, et euh, même les modes de sélection sont différents pour ces types de projets. Si tous les organismes subventionnaires laissaient un peu d'air 1, 2 de la, du budget de recherche pour de la véritable innovation en recherche et pour favoriser l'interdisciplinarité et l'intersectorialité, euh, je pense que ce serait euh, déjà euh, un, voilà, des perspectives intéressantes. Uh, I, I'm sorry for, for the anglophones. Uh, I, I, I will talk to you uh, with a glass of wine. It will be easier. Thank you. <laughs> I agree with absolutely everything you said, <laughs> though I didn't fully understand it. <laughs> but I'm sure I do agree. Um, I'm not sure I, I can, I'm not going to try to answer the, all the, the comments and questions. There are more comments than questions, and that's all really valid. But I, I would say that, that um, in terms of whose responsibilities lie where, no one gets a free ride. Uh, and it's clear that the scientific community cannot close its eyes to what's happening around it, and, and doesn't want to, I'm sure. Uh, it's also true that the policymakers had better open up their eyes to the reality of what's around them because they're not paying attention. They're using science as an excuse not to do things constantly. Uh, it's a constant refrain that there's a technological fix for literally everything. When you look at what came out of the Rio Plus 20 conference last year in, in Rio de Janeiro, uh, it's a hopelessly sad document. And in every paragraph, it says something about new technologies will take care of this just constantly, and that, that you shouldn't let them get away with stuff like that. And then I think it's also true that the public has got to have the chance 
to learn and understand more about science and policy making. But I do agree that, that and I think one thing you said earlier was, was that the, um, uh, the public does kind of get ownership and control. It does kind of get the ability to follow the money in who's making the decisions. And I think that's one thing that the scientific community hasn't been perhaps as open about as it should be. Uh, uh, to give it, I mean, we're seeing a, a remarkable decline in, for example, private sector research. We're seeing a decline in the number of startup companies in, in North America and in Europe. We're seeing a decline in the number of employees in those startup companies. We're seeing a decline in venture capital investment in those companies. So in the private sector, we're not getting much anymore from that. What we're getting is such a level of corporate concentration that the need to innovate is lower than it's been in about a century. They don't need to innovate now. You have such a concentration of power in the hands of so few companies, they trade the patents with each other, so there's no need. I mean, you don't do private research, you do public relations about the private research. That's all you have to do. And to give an example in terms of agriculture, which is an area that I began my work with, but we're in many other areas now, if you look at, it's not just the three companies that control 54% of the seeds, it is just six companies globally control 75% of all private sector research in agricultural inputs. Six companies. And they have all cross-licensed each other. So you will not get innovation from that group. They have no need to innovate. So if we're looking to, or hoping that, the private sector will get us through all of this, no, it won't. The concentration isn't there. If you go back to the Royal Commission on Corporate Concentration, back in the 1970s, they said that, and no one's ever denied this, it's been around the world, if you get more than a four-company concentration that has more than 50% of the market, you see a rapid decline in the innovation level. Well, that's in every sector, of, of whether we're talking about pharmaceuticals or we're talking about uh, farms. That's what we're faced with. So as scientists, don't get trapped into that environment and at least be aware of the fact that ownership and control is central to what science you're going to be allowed to do. Thank you. Is it my turn? Yep. Yes. All right, you're last. I would just make two comments. Um, the first one is that this question, the comment that was raised that, that science and the scientific method is everywhere. It's absolutely true. In fact, um, Thomas Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, 150 years ago, said that science is nothing more than the normal working of the human mind. And I, I think that that's actually reassuring because it means that in principle, it shouldn't be that difficult to sell science to the public because they all do it. I guess the other point that I would make is, um, and I guess maybe this is a message of hope, is that I, I don't know whether people know Stuart Kaufman, a very famous theoretical biophysicist, and in 1992 he wrote a book called At Home in the Universe. And the thesis of his book, which he put forward with, for both uh, theoretical and empirical evidence, was that the most rapid evolution of complex systems occurs at the edge of chaos. And I guess maybe, I, this is something I don't know nothing about, but I guess from the comments that I've heard about technology governance, we're sitting at the edge of chaos, so maybe if Dr. Kaufman is right, we can expect rapid evolution. Thank you. Um, I, I want to reassure you, because you said you, I think you were f not frightened, it's not the word you use, but you felt that it was like a bit too much. Uh, if um, you were to go in science, I think the contrary. I think it's marvelous, because more it is complex, more it will force people to work together because science at the end of the day is multidisciplinary. It's not an individual act. And so uh, I, my wish is that uh, people will, will stop working alone and thinking they have the solutions because in fact, if they talk more to people, um, they will see that Science is everywhere, and in fact, uh, other people can help them to see something that they had not seen. And I guess I'll finish by a story. Um, at the college, we do a lot of applied research, and thanks to the funding from the from NSERC. And uh, and it's a true true story. What I will tell you, um, 
there was, a, as you know, concussion are quite dangerous when you hurt yourself if you're playing hockey or things like that. And there was this person uh, from Ottawa uh, that had this idea that maybe if we put a sensor in the, in the helmet of uh, a person that has a concu concussion, maybe we could see how um, dramatic or how dangerous has been the concussion. And uh, what happened is that um, someone heard about his, uh, the approach Algonquin College and finally they did the prototype and they worked on it, they tested it. And uh, people heard about it. And uh, there was this person on TV that did, uh, uh, not a show, but a clip, if you want, on this invention. Um, and it was done by Impact, if you wonder what was the sensor. And uh, Impact Incorporated. And what happened is that when the person, the journalist, okay, did the, um, the, the clip, uh, he was talking about this gizmo, if you want, this sensor that was inside the helmet. And he said, you know, isn't it marvelous? Because one day we'll be able to see what happened on the concussion on this iPhone. Then the two guys that work on this sensor, you know, looked at each other and they thought, oh, my God, we never thought about that. So what happened, and that's a true story, what happened, they uh, had their sensor, it had worked and all that, but then they decided to build an app to go on an iPhone so that it could be used by a coach who would have the sensor in each of the helmet of his team, and he could see who had, was green light with respect to the concussion, who was yellow light, and who was red light. So as you can see, that's my conclusion, that science basically is everybody. Everybody can give someone an idea and after the science process starts. But you, you, you need to have a spark at one point and be able to seize the opportunity and to seize how it can make a difference in the life of people because now this invention exists the app exists, and now they are working on phase two, but unfortunately, they couldn't tell me what it was yet. Well, the well, well, the and maybe we could change the rules of the game. I would like to join you to thank our panel. I'd like you to join me in thanking this extraordinary panel for... Thank yous. So thank you for this panel, for all the other panels, all the speakers. We had uh, really great presentations on these uh, two and a half days. I can really say that uh, it was a very high quality and I learned a lot. Uh, maybe more questions than answers, but that's still learning and uh, I'm very grateful for that. Um, also would like to actually thank the audience for coming. It has been a long day. Thanks to you. Thank you for still being here. Thanks to the poster presenters, we had seven posters. It's a lot of work. Hey? I, I have done posters myself. One underestimates uh, how much work it is. They were great. Uh, they provided entertainment for our first reception, so thank you for that. Thanks to 17 volunteers. I don't know if any, could the volunteers in the room stand up, please, for a sec? Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. It was, uh, I, I actually was not involved very much. Uh, Susan McKee managed uh, the volunteers. Thanks for that, Susan. It was quite magical. There were people moving around, doing things. I just thought, it's very beautiful. Just continue on. <laughs> I didn't know what they did, but it worked out marvelously. Thank you very much for that. Um, program committee. So Gordon, myself, uh, we were helped by Emily Tector, who is Emily? Up back there. Uh, also, Jeremy Geelan, who did 
uh, enormous amount. Both Emily and Jeremy did just unbelievable amounts of work uh, in two cities here in Canada, and thanks very much for you know, just going through this. Uh, also, here, local Dara Marcus and Barbara Kubica did a huge amount of work. Thanks a lot. I'm really happy for your help. With this, I just, Gordon, do you want to talk briefly about our sponsors? Unfortunately, it takes money to do things like that. But uh, we were very grateful, very lucky with the support we got. So I and it's been great working with ISSP. Uh, hopefully, this is just the beginning of the uh, collaboration between our two organizations. Uh, as we move into the next uh, phase of development. And now is the rolling credits. Uh, UNESCO has supported us, you know, AECL, of course, uh, University of Ottawa, the Professional Institute of the Public Service of Canada. SHRC is very generous, uh, providing both through our organizations and a special grant for this. Uh, Canadian Climate Forum, Institute for Ethics, British High Commissioner of Ottawa, uh, Canada Science and Technology Museums, corporations, UCL London, and the Embassy of the United States, who are probably listening right now. Uh, and uh, of course, all of you attendees. Now, we've got a reception over the way, across the way. I think there, oh, somewhere, yeah, over there. See the next room over. And I think that there's one ticket per person, right, for uh, the booze, because we can't sell any or something like that. Uh, but, so we don't have to have an app to monitor your drunkenness. Please join us in a further discussion, and thank you very much for an extremely informative and rather unique forum. Thank you. We no, no, I'm good. I'm good. That's it. Okay. Thank you.